Okay, variable interest entities <clears throat> and special purpose entities. These fit into chapter three and they bring up a lot of important issues in the ethics of consolidation. Believe it or not, ethics and consolidation are very closely related. There are a lot of ethical issues that come in consolidation because consolidation can be used to obscure a lot of information. And um, we, as accountants, we don't want to obscure important information. So the biggest news in accounting in perhaps the last 20 years was the Enron scandal. <coughs> and what happened was <clears throat> Enron reported its earnings in October 2001. And they reported a regular increase in earnings, <clears throat> except for non-recurring charges. And um, at the very bottom of the press release, it says that non-recurring charges exceeded a billion dollars, which exceeded all of the profits Enron ever earned. <laughs> it was like a little paragraph at the bottom of the press release. The press release said... Ah, we released new higher earnings than expected and all these other nice things about Enron. Then the last paragraph, is, by the way, we're, we're writing off some assets and it's going to be $1.01 billion. I guess they couldn't find a way to keep it under a billion dollars. They just broke a billion dollars. So you could see what happened to Enron stock. Enron stock completely crashed. Everybody's like, what in the world is going on? Because here is a company that was on top of the world and this was the future enron took on this idea of commoditization and collateralization and taking all sorts of different things and packaging them and slicing them and dicing them and spinning them off into different companies that people could buy so you could invest in commodities bandwidth not just electricity, you could invest in electricity futures, you can invest in bandwidth futures and all sorts of bizarre <laughs> instruments that the Enron geniuses came up with. And the future of the world was in this type of commoditization that Enron was the foremost expert at doing. And so Enron stock was flying high. You can see that it's earning 15% in the 15% region. Everybody thinks that this is the greatest company in a really long time. And there's some concerns that everything is not quite the way it should be there. But the company's making so much money. And what it's doing is so revolutionary that people believe that this is the future. And Enron is there first. It was an oil and gas company. But it's gone into all these other fantastic fields that it's making a lot of money in. And it's doing all kinds of deals that are creative in ways that people other companies have not yet thought of and this is the future and then they came out with this press release and again at the very bottom of the press release it says that they lost a billion dollars but that's non-recurring so you can ignore it and um i was like oh, what's going on here and so let me back up a little bit about what Enron was doing and what was happening. And it's just, this is funny how they framed it. No, you know, there's, there's an expression sometimes that it's good to give bad news first. And there's different kinds of people. These people give bad news first and then they give the good news. And there's people who give the good news first and they give the bad news. My own belief is I always like to set expectations low and exceed them. Not that you should do that on purpose, but don't, don't, don't be so great and bold and talk so big that you're not going to be able to live up to expectations. I've, I have had people, I've known people like that and they do nothing but disappoint. But what you probably want to do is you, you, you want to give people bad news. You, you do have to sometimes give people bad news. And the way they did the press release was particularly bizarre in that they saved the bad news for the last paragraph and like, ah, it's no bit, don't pay, don't pay attention to the billion dollars, you know, we're just having a normal quarter here. And um, so this goes back to something called special purpose entities. And what you might notice here is they have no operations. And really the idea is you create an entity 
And the main thing that the entity does is it holds assets and has financing for those assets. So you would create special purpose entities. Let's say that you want to do a sale leaseback. You have a piece of property and you what you want to do is you want to sell it and then lease it back. You could create a special purpose entity to do that. And what you would do is you create a special purpose entity and you have other owners, other people are going to own that special purpose entity. You find your investors, they invest money in the special purpose entity. You sell the special purpose entity your property and then you rent the property back. So this special purpose entity doesn't actually do anything. It doesn't make widgets. It just owns the property. It collects the rent from you and it gives the rent to the stockholders, to, the, to its owners. So that's what a special purpose entity is. And they're not, they don't just, they can hold all sorts of different things. So an example of a special purpose entity is, um, is banks collateralize mortgages. And what they could do is they could sell a whole package of mortgages to an SPE and investors can invest in that SPE and be investing in those mortgages. So the idea is that <clears throat> the way Enron is using these special purpose entities is it would take various activities and move them into the SPE, um, usually assets, and then have outside investors invest in the SPE to, um, to finance those assets. And you could also have banks, you can, an SPE can borrow money. So maybe the investors invest 20% of the asset value and the other 80% comes from a bank. And these investors are kind of, they're related to you. You may be servicing those assets in some way and you may be managing the books of the SPE. The SPE doesn't make widgets. It doesn't have a president and a vice president. I mean, maybe it has someone on paper, but it doesn't really do anything. It just holds these assets on behalf of the investors in the bank. And what Enron did was it would shift money losing transactions and money assets that were overvalued and often liabilities into off its own balance sheet and into the SPE. And it would set up the transactions in such a way that the SPE was on the money losing side. So, and the idea is that if you can set up the SPE properly, where you don't own any piece of it, it's owned by outside investors, then you don't have to consolidate it. It's a separate company. It is not your company. And you can pretty much, you have to run it, you, you have to manage it, but you don't actually own it. It's owned by outside people. And the financing comes from outside people. And it happens to be a company you're doing business with. But because you don't have any ownership share in it, then you don't have to consolidate it. So you could take highly levered assets and move them into an SPE along with all that debt and take use it to keep debt off your books. Now, how do you get investors to go for this, right? It would be one thing if you put good assets into an SPE, they would want to invest in it. But what if you put bad assets into an SPE? What you have to do then is you need some mechanism to get your investors and the bank, of course, to cooperate. And that means you need to usually give them some kind of guarantee. And that's where things got messed up. So the classic transaction of the Raptors in... The Raptors is very interesting. This was in the late '90s, and they um, they liked um, Spielberg and especially Star Wars movies. So a lot of the transactions are named after Star Wars characters. It's pretty funny. Anyway, the Raptors, which is after Jurassic Park, was established by CFO Jeff Skilling to accept Enron assets that were perhaps overvalued. I shouldn't say perhaps overvalued. They were overvalued. And by selling the assets to an SPE, 
Enron could take the money and pay off debt. But the SPE would have a ton of debt. So they would look for a third party to just buy the assets from them and if they could and then rent it back. But oftentimes they couldn't. So what they would do is they would establish an SPE to take the asset. And then they would it says sponsoring institution that's not quite clear 90 percent of the financing didn't really come from them it really came from a bank but there's a third party involved here and so the third party is really the owner so here you can see a flow chart and it's the truth is that it's really much more complicated than this uh, and you can see there's jedi chuko um are the names of some of them so an example here would be that would be chuco investments and chuco investments is a general partner and sonr number one the money for this some of it came from michael copper and william dodson but most of the money for chuco's investment is really coming from Barclays Bank in the form of a note. Because Barclays Bank is giving a huge amount of money to Chuco, and then Chuco is sustaining all of these investments with Barclays money. Now, how? why would Barclays give them all this money? And then slowly but surely, assets are being moved into these green items here, which are the various SPEs. And there's actually more than this. Um, and assets are being sold to these and but these because the, the relationship between these and enron enron doesn't own them friends of enron like william dotson william cop michael copper and stuff they own them or they're limited partners in them and therefore enron doesn't need to consolidate them but why would barclays give him so much money to do this and you can see the money flowing all over the place here. But it's really coming from the bank and it's coming from outside investors. Enron is guaranteeing the debt. And paying fees to Barclays. So Barclays in it. But look at what happened here.